dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policymaking upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research China has identified the cause of a mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. More than 3 billion people in almost 70 countries and territories have been asked to stay at home. The COVID-19 pandemic challenged the whole world. No matter one's age or nationality, it affected everyone. However, the impact of COVID-19 was not the same for all. The least advantaged sectors such as the poor, the less educated, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples bore much of the brunt. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted and exacerbated deep-seated economic, social, and political inequalities and cultural inequities. As we traverse the road to recovery, it is crucial to address these inequalities to strengthen the resilience of vulnerable and marginalized groups to future shocks and ensure that no one is left behind as we move forward from this pandemic. Thus, this September, 
through the observance of the Development Policy Research Month, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, and its partner institutions. Call on our leaders and policymakers to make social justice the front and center of the post-pandemic recovery plan to accelerate the country's recovery from COVID-19 and prepare for future shocks. In the Philippines, the 1987 Constitution frames the promotion of social justice as a commitment to create equitable economic opportunities. It envisions a nation where all members of society enjoy the same basic rights, liberties, opportunities, and protection. Social justice is also the bedrock of many international declarations in which the Philippines is a signatory, such as the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Copenhagen Declaration, and the UN Millennium Declaration. It is also enshrined in the country's development blueprints, the Philippine Development Plan, or PDP, and the Ambition Natin 2040. So the annual public policy conference which is the main and culminating activity of the DPRM, we encourage our policymakers, the private sector, research and academic institutions, and civil society to work together in reducing and removing the socioeconomic and political inequalities and cultural inequities that divide us. Applying social justice in our policies, plans, and programs should be premised on a holistic approach that sees the organic and functional interrelationship between and among the different sectors of society. We need to recognize that the inequalities and inequities experienced by our vulnerable and marginalized countrymen affect the whole of society as this hamper the attainment of broad-based, inclusive, and sustainable development. Certain areas are in dire need of reforms using a social justice perspective Foremost is education. Policymakers and education providers must design modes of education delivery that are sensitive to the needs of learners, especially those from low-income households, students, regardless of economic status, gender, location, disability, and ethnicity, must have access to quality education. Given the importance of Information and Communications Technology, or ICT, in delivering education and accessing information, the digital divide must be addressed to ensure that everyone has equal access to learning opportunities and digital resources. To protect subsistence and temporary workers from sudden and extended job disruptions, there is a need to improve the design, targeting, and implementation of social protection programs. Likewise, we need a progressive budgeting process that pushes resources to people and places that need them the most. We must also ensure that our public health services are affordable and accessible, especially to vulnerable and marginalized sectors. Policy makers should bet for increased investments in health programs that directly address the needs of the population. It is time for our health care system to adopt a life cycle approach by making quality health care services affordable and accessible to all from birth to old age. Also, we need to protect communities that often endure the damage caused by environmental destruction and climate change. We must avoid activities that harm the environment, violate human rights, and endanger the well-being of vulnerable groups, including cultural minorities. We must ensure that no infrastructure, housing, or development project jeopardizes the health safety, and welfare of communities. Thus, assessing the potential impact of proposed projects is crucial to reduce the likelihood of unintended consequences. Lastly, we must increase the participation of the vulnerable and marginalized sectors in policy discourse and decision-making and make sure their voices are heard. 
This can be done by strengthening government civil society engagements and intensifying the use of bottom-up approaches. The pursuit of social justice is not easy. It is a long and complex process. But through our united effort and shared responsibility, we can have a society where the country's resources and the fruits of economic growth are equitably shared, where everyone is living with dignity and has access to essential services, where the rights of the poor and vulnerable are upheld, and where the environment is nurtured and protected. For more details about this year's DPRM celebration, including the annual public policy conference, visit the PIDS and DPRM websites and follow us on Facebook. Magandang araw sa lahat. Welcome to the second webinar of the 8th Annual Public Policy Conference, Human Capital Development and Social Protection. This webinar is organized by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies with support from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Research Academy. I'm Maria Cristina Epetia, your MC and moderator today. We are honored that our forum features two speakers from the UNICEF Philippines and the Asian Development Bank and a panel of practitioners and experts on human capital development and social protection. The presentations of our speakers will be followed by a moderated discussion with our panelists. Through this, this discussion and your participation, we hope to draw out policy insights on providing equitable opportunities for quality education, decent work, and social protection in the Philippines. For everyone's information, we are recording this session, which will be which will be made publicly available on the PIDS YouTube channel. To start the program, we will have the opening remarks of Dr. Aniceto C. Orbeta, the president of PIDS. Sir? Officials and representatives from the different government agencies, private sector, academe, civil society, and international organizations. Webinar speakers and panelists, including Mr. I.C. Pinegold of the United Nations Children's Fund, Dr. Samir Katiwada, and Mr. Amil Jelani of the Asian Development Bank, Dr. Elizabeth King of Broken Institution, Mr. Juan Miguel Luz of Quality Education Design Company, 
and Ms. Lovelyn Basiliotti of the Philippine Business for Education. Our friends from media and those who are watching through PIDS and SERPI Facebook pages. Good morning and welcome to the second installment of our four-part webinar series of the Annual Public Policy Conference or APPC. The APPC is the main event of the Development Policy Research Month of, or DPRM celebration led by PIDS every September to underscore the importance of policy research in crafting evidence-based plans, policies, and programs. This year's uh, theme uh, is also the theme of the APPC is hashtag close the pandemic accelerate post-pandemic recovery through social justice. PIDS initiated this theme to underscore how the pandemic exacerbated existing and socioeconomic disparities in the country and disproportionately affected the vulnerable and marginalized sector of society. Thus, to make the opportunities equitable and reduce inequalities and inequities, we urge our leaders and policymakers to make social justice a guiding principle of the country's post-pandemic recovery plan. In our first webinar on Tuesday, our distinguished uh, guest speaker, Nobel laureate, uh, Professor James Hickman of the University of Chicago, tackled the, an alternative paradigm on, of uh, addressing poverty and social immobility to skills formation. Based on empirical evidence, he argued for the need for focus on skills formation from birth to adulthood and the importance of tapping the various institutions of society, not just the schools. In today's webinar, we will unpack social justice further by looking at the application in human develop, capital development and social protection. Specifically, we will discuss how social justice can be applied in addressing the inequities in uh, access to quality education, in improving the welfare of the working poor, and informal workers and in enhancing the design and delivery of social protection. The pandemic affected all segments of the population, but its impact has the harshest and the most disruptive uh, for the marginalized and vulnerable sectors. This was glaring reality in our education sectors. Many learners, particularly from low-income groups, had difficulty transitioning to online and distance learning at the height of the pandemic. The prolonged school closures in the Philippines one of the longest in the world, translated to staggering learning losses with unprecedented economic and social costs. While face-to-face -face classes has resumed, the perennial issues uh, in the sector remain. At 2022 PIDS study noted the serious issues in school infrastructure, including the inadequacy of classrooms, gaps in access to computers and the internet by both learners and teachers, and insufficient access to sanitation and basic hygiene facilities. Before the pandemic struck, the declining quality of basic education in the country as reflected in, by the low performance of Filipino students in reading, math, and science in various international assessments was already the focus of many policy and academic discussions. In the labor sector, the employment of, Filipi millions of, Filipi employment of millions of Filipinos were severely affected. In April 2020, a month after the lockdown was implemented, the country experienced the lowest labor force participation rate in history, which was at 55.6% based on the uh, Philippine Statistics Authority's labor force survey. The impacts were not the same even, uh, even for the fortunate enough to retain the employment. Data from the World Bank showed that 46% of employees in the richest quantile could work from home, thus could reduce the risk of infection. This was not the case for the poorest quantile. Only 21% of their employees could work from home, reflecting that many low-income workers were regularly exposed to COVID-19 and had high risk of acquiring infections. Unfortunately, most are also engaged in low pay, temporary or informal work, as well as precarious work conditions with limited access to social protection. Our discussion today will revisit these issues. Our speakers and panelists will provide insights on how the government, private sector, and international ins institutions can work together to achieve, the social, achieve social justice in human capital development, through equitable access to quality education, decent work, and social protection amid a wide economic and social disparities. I would like to thank the Banco Central of Filipinas, or BSP, for partnering with PIDS once again in the conduct of the APPC. 
BSB's general support enables PIDS to tap the expertise of respected local and international speakers for this annual conference. To our speakers and panelists, thank you for accepting our invitation to be part of the, our conference this year. To our participants, let's keep an open mind, open and inquiring mind as we listen to the discussion. And I also encourage you to participate in the open forum. Thank you very much. I now give back the floor to the moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta, for the overview and what our audience can expect for today's webinar. May I ask our speakers and panelists to open their videos for a short uh, photo op? Uh, we will be assisted by our platform host, Thea. Thank you, Dr. Tina. Okay, uh, let's wait for... Okay, there you go. Okay, uh, let me just... Um... Take a few screenshots. Okay, put on your best smile. One, two, three. Okay. Uh Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, just a short reminder that we've allotted a time for the open forum. For those who are with us here in Zoom, you may post your questions and comments in the Q&A box. Please indicate your name and organization if you'd like to be identified when we read out your questions. This forum is also live streamed on the Facebook pages of PIDS and SERP, so we will be taking questions from those platforms as, as well. At this point, we will hear from our speakers. Let me invite our first speaker, Mr. I.C. Feingold, who will present about the learning crisis in the Philippines and how to recover the learning losses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Feingold is Chief of Education at UNICEF Philippines. He has more than 15 years of experience in the public sector, in the design, implementation, and evaluation of education and social programs. He previously served as a National Director of Secondary Education at the Ministry of Education in Peru, General Director of Social Policy at the Ministry of Social Development and Inclusion in Peru, and the Global Director of Policy at the Teach for All in London. He has also worked in the World Bank's education team in Washington, D.C. He holds a Master's Degree in Public Affairs from Princeton University. Mr. Feingold, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for, for this kind invitation. I'm going to um, share my screen. Can you, can you see it? Yes, Mr. Feingold, we can see your screen. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. And um, again, good morning, everyone. Today, I would like to, um, to share some, some insights and some reflections on the learning crisis in the Philippines in, in, in particular, and um, some recommendations to recover from the learning losses. And we, we hear from um, Dr. Orbet at the beginning that even before the pandemic, the Philippines was already facing a learning crisis. And we have seen uh, some of these numbers that I'm, that I'm sharing. Uh, this, uh, um, these graphs from the CPLM, which was um, uh, an initiative from UNICEF and other partners to measure the learning levels in, in Southeast Asia. So we found that only 10% of the Filipino students at grade five were uh, reaching the, the minimum expected level and 17% for, for mathematics. So this was a um, significant law and, and it was an, an issue of concern that also reconfirm the results for secondary level from PISA that came out a year before um, um, that tested the learning levels in mathematics, in reading and science for those who are 15 years old. And uh, as um, uh, you all might remember the Philippines was uh, the last one in reading among 79 countries and second to last one in, in mathematics and, and science. So this was one of the first signals that we got um, back in 2019 when the results came out that uh, there was a learning crisis that we all knew and, and we all um, had seen 
um, the result from the national achievement test, but this was the first international test that um, brought these results. So around 80% of the Filipino students at the secondary level were not achieving the proficiency in, uh, in reading and math. And there were other indicators from, from PISA test um, beyond the, the, the cognitive uh, skills part. No? For example, 60% of the Filipino students that were part of, of the sample reported that they had been bullied at least a few times in the last month, no? while the average for, for the OECD countries was uh, one third of that. No? In fact, the Philippines was the country among the 79 that participated in, in PISA with the highest level of, of bullying uh, self-reported by, by the students. No? And, and this is also related to another important finding from, from the PISA test on what it was called the growth mindset. And this is defined in, in the PISA test as uh, how the students perceive the, their intelligence. If, if they think that the intelligence can grow or the intelligence is something or something fixed. And, and for me, one of the most fascinating findings from, 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 this, from this last round of PISA in 2018 was the strong correlation between the results in, in the PISA test and the proportion of students uh, in each country that think that their intelligence can grow. No? So you can see in this graph that there is a, a positive correlation. When you have a higher proportion of students in your country, that uh, think that their intelligence can improve, can grow, these are the countries with better results in, in the PISA test. No? And we see that the Philippines um, was among the lowest in terms of uh, proportion of students that think that their intelligence can grow. So it's around 30% 30, 30 of the students in the Philippines think, have this growth mindset. No? So, this finding together with the finding on, on the level of bullying and others are also confirmation of the issues related to the social emotional learning that is um, as important as, as the cognitive development in, in the students. And this is an area that um, we all should be more aware of. No? So uh, I also wanted to, to share today um, other findings from a study that UNICEF did uh, in the Philippines, uh, following a cohort of more than 3,400 children for almost six years, you know, from 2015 to 2020, right before the pandemic. So this was also a confirmation of, of the learning crisis. And um, this, this, um, this finding from, from these results um, contribute to the discussion to better understand what are, what are the challenges in terms of the learning crisis and the learning recovery. So um, first, one of the, the findings is that in mathematics, uh, no student in, in this research appear to have the necessary foundational skills required to understand the grade four mathematics curriculum no? among the more than 3,400 students that participated. In literacy, the results are, are uh, slightly better, but it's only 25% of the students that at grade five achieve the level of reading and understanding that, that was ex expected. Uh, uh, on the positive side of, of the finding is that uh, almost half of the students understood the meaning of, of short text in three different languages, in, in this case, the mother tongue, uh, Filipino and, and English. Also, another interesting finding is that uh, children from conflict affected areas were on average two years behind their peers in, in other groups. Now, this longitudinal study was done in different parts of the Philippines. And one of the areas was um, uh, Maguindanao in Bar. So the, the students there are on average two years behind the, their peers in other groups. And also children in conflict affected area demonstrated lower levels of socio-emotional skills. So this longitudinal study measured cognitive and socio-emotional skill development. And, and one additional important finding is that those children who attended preschool or the child development centers consistently outperformed 
those who didn't attend preschool. And this is um, this was true for the, the cognitive skills, but also for the social emotional the social emotional skills. Um, for example, in this in this graph, you can see the um, relation between attending preschool and social emotional learning. So the the line in green is those students in each of the rounds of the longitudinal study that uh, outperform those in the red line, th those children that did not uh, attend the preschool. No? This is consistent uh, for every round of the, this six, five year study. Also, there is a, a strong correlation between the foundational skills, in this case, mathematics and literacy and social emotional skills. We have seen this in, in other studies, including, for example, this, this correlation that I show in PISA between the growth mindset and the, and the results, uh, the cognitive skills. No? So this was reconfirmed for uh, both for literacy and, 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 and mathematics in, in the rounds that we did for, for, the, for the study. Um, and also related to gender, of the of the longitudinal study and also in con in the cognitive skills and this was also confirmed in CPLM and PISA for for all the subjects that were evaluated so this is another area of concern in terms of developing um, tailored policies for for the boys who are lagging behind in the system so all, all the data that I've been showing is uh, pre-pandemic, but we know that with uh, COVID-19, the, um, the school closures have affected um, the learning levels and also um, exacerbated the learning poverty and the inequalities. No? And in some areas in the Philippines, there was even a double crisis after the super typhoon that hit um, many parts of the country. So the challenge of, of reopening schools and recovery learning was even more complex in, in this part of, of the Philippines, specifically in the, in the Caraga region and, and Southern Leyte. And this graph that, that you can see in the screen uh, shows a, a correlation between the length of the school closure and the proportion of, of children that can, re can read a simple text. No? And we see um, also, this correlation that those countries that had the longest school closure are also those that have a lower proportion of children that can read a simple text at, at age 10. So um, this implies that the, the COVID-19 crisis is uh, going to exacerbate the inequalities and those who, who were behind would uh, face more challenges for, for learning recovery. Um, and in addition to, to the learning loss and, and the inequality, so we know that there are other effects of um, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in, the, in, in education and, and also even in the economy. So there's, there are some studies that have calculated the, um, the loss of average annual earning uh, in the future no, for, for this generation. Uh, but there are other effects related to uh, increasing of dropouts to increasing potential increase of uh, teen pregnancy, child labor, um, and even um, domestic violence. So there are a number of uh, negative impact no, of, of the measures that have been taken. And um, for for the focus on, of my presentation, I mean the main concern is on the on the learning loss and not only the cognitive learning loss, but also the social emotional learning loss. So UNICEF with other partners are recommending this called rapid framework. These are a set of global recommendations that, uh, that include um, reaching every child and keep them in school, assessing the learning levels regularly, um, prioritizing the foundational skills, um, increasing the efficiency of instruction and, and developing and expanding remedial programs 
And finally, the D is for developing so psychosocial health and well-being support. Now, this is uh, more related to the point I was making on the social emotional learning. Um, but using this framework and going a, a bit beyond, I, I, I would like to finalize my presentation with some um, specific uh, recommendations for, for the Philippines, for the process of, of learning recovery. Um, one of the, the most important ones and, and related to the R in the RAPID framework is reopening all, all preschools um, and keeping the schools and learning centers reopened. We know that recently for this school year, the, the process had um, accelerated, but preschools and in particular child development centers are, um, are have been lagging behind in the process that is important that we, we all can, can support it. Uh, the ECCD Council recently uh, released the advisory, ECCD Council advisory number eight, uh, recommending the, the process of um, reopening schools. So September 5 was the recommended date for this. And in BARM, uh, we know that they are setting for the, the last week of September. But this all this process of reopening school depend on, on the local government unit. So it's important to support them to, to accelerate this process. Um, second is the conduct of rapid literacy and, and numeracy assessments and implementing remedial programs with an equity focus. We know that some children are, are lagging behind in the process and it's important to have tailored, tailored strategies. There are already great examples. Um, uh, for example, in Region 8, uh, UNICEF has been uh, working with the Department uh, of Education, with the regional office and, and the school uh, division to um, conduct these this, uh, rapid assessments and and accelerate the process of uh, remedial of implementing remedial programs, and this is based on an experience from from USA uh, with the ABC Plus programs in other regions that are also um, implementing this um, this type of strategies. But it's important to expand it to 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 all the regions. Um, third, uh, another important recommendation is developing social emotional learning strategies and mental health and psychosocial support for students and teachers. We, we know that the Department of Education through the DRMS is already implementing this, this type of strategies that, as I mentioned um, in the findings, is crucial and should complement the, the foundational skills development strategies. Uh, fourth, the reprioritization of early childhood education. We know that during the pandemic, um, we all have lost attention on the first years and how important they are which was already a consensus before the pandemic, but we need to uh, regain the attention of this, expanding the access and quality, uh, and identify more effective institutional arrangements to ensure that we can accelerate this, this effort. And um, the fifth recommendation is launching a national digital learning program uh, progressively, but um, um, as early as possible, at the same time, um, expanding the internet connectivity to, to all schools and, and distributing devices with learning contact, uh, content for rural and last mile schools as a priority, accompanied by, by, teacher, by teacher training programs. And, and this last point is linked to, to the next recommendation um, um, in terms of providing more support to teachers. Um, we have seen in the pandemic that uh, they have done an extraordinary effort to, con to ensure learning continuity, but we know that it's uh, critical to elevate the value of the teaching profession, providing more support and an incentive for you know, an essential part of, of any education system. Um, the, the second to last uh, recommendation is developing policies for parental engagement in education, including a stronger teaching parent coordination mechanisms and promoting more um, interactions between parents so they can support each other um, with additional guidance and, and, and policies that promote their, their involvement in the education of their children. And finally, to, to, um, to, to finalize my presentation, the last point 
uh, that can make all the other recommendations possible is increasing the, the budget allocation and the investments in, in, in the Philippines education system. And especially for the implementation of the Basic Education Development Plan 2030. So some concrete recommendations that have been discussed as, the, as part of the Transforming Education Summit national consultations are um, increasing the, the national education budget to reach at least 6% of the GDP and 20% of the national budget by, by the year 2030. So this would require um, strong political commitments to prioritize education and reach these levels that would ensure that, that there could be a, a real transformation in, in the Philippines education. Also, um, setting at least 10% 10, 10 of the education budget to early childhood education. We know that this is one of the most effective policies to, to improve learning, to ensure that children access education uh, from year uh, when they are three and four years old and, and ensuring a quality service at this level. Another uh, specific recommendation related to budget is uh, doubling the, the special education funds from 1% to 2% on the real property taxes at the LUU level. So this would uh, increase um, uh, the, the budget that the local government unit would have to allocate for education. And finally, the promotion of partnership with the private sector and creating incentives for more private investment in education. We know the, the crucial role that the private sector can play uh, in transforming the education system. And we know that this is, um, this is a responsibility beyond the government or the public sector. We all that are part of the education system from the private sector, from uh, development partners, from civil society have, have a role to play in, 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 in this uh, important sector that, are, that is facing um, one of the biggest challenges no? it has faced in, in history with, with the pandemic and, and the additional crisis uh, brought by, by natural disasters. So um, I, these are, some, some recommendations for discussion, but would love to, to, to hear from the panelists and, and then um, also answer questions from the public later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Feingold, for that presentation, for providing insightful and practical recommendations on how to address the learning crisis faced by Filipino children. Now we will now, we will now have our second speaker, Dr. Samir Katiwada who will be presenting the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on labor markets and the policies that mitigated its impact. Dr. Katiwada is Senior Public Management Economist at the South Asia Department of the Asian Development Bank. His research interest is spread across areas such as impact of technology on employment, innovation and structural transformation, industrial policy, enterprise dynamics, and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on labor markets. Prior to joining the Asian Development Bank, he spent nearly 10 years at the International Labor Organization. He holds a PhD in economics from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and has a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University. Dr. Katiwada, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, please let me know if you can see my presentation. Uh, we can see your presentation, Dr. Katiwada. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, switching from the impact on education because of extended school closures and, and the learning crisis that we just heard, um, that was an excellent presentation. I'm going to pivot to labor market, the labor market impact. Um, of, of the pandemic. Um, so this is a study that uh, ADB recently came out with. This was now actually, it's been uh, several months. It came out last December, uh, COVID-19 and labor markets in Southeast Asia. So the areas that I will cover uh, this morning, uh, first to sort of go over the questions that we are trying to answer um, in this study that we tried to answer and the data and the methods that we used and some of the main findings. 
Um, and then um, I will focus a bit on uh, what policies mitigated the impact. And here looking at social protection and labor markets in, in Southeast Asia. Basically, uh, looking at what type of uh, social protection measures uh, seem to have worked uh, and so draw some lessons uh, from that. Um, the context, as you all know, this, you know, uh, I don't think I need to go over this in great detail, but, you know, one of the main questions we were trying to answer with this work is how did labor markets in Southeast Asia adjust to the COVID 19 shock? Um, and who have been hurt, uh, who has been hurt the most? And here, uh, we look at five countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, we examine the scale and shape of the impacts and adjustment patterns. And we also look at sort of the contextual and institutional factors as well. And in terms of policies here, uh, we have tried to look at the social protection measures and then see if they have mitigated uh, some of the impact on the, on the labor market. In terms of the data, the reason why you might wonder why those five countries is because, um, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam have uh, very good, reliable labor force surveys. So we wanted to make sure we could use um, the, the micro data to do this analysis. Uh, countries like Cambodia, Laos and others, we couldn't really include because we don't have uh, regular uh, labor force surveys in those countries. Uh, we also made some alternative, made use of some alternative and, and supplementary sources. Um, uh, from particularly from the ADBI, uh, again, those were used as a descriptive um, descriptive analysis. The data on social protection, uh, most of it comes from the ILO social protection database, but also from World Bank's Aspire database and also uh, from IPCIG, the social protection responses to COVID-19 uh, database as well. Um, quickly on the methods, we have used pseudo panels constructed by sex and age cohorts to follow the progression of demographic groups uh, across the labor force status and transitions within, within employment as well. Then we uh, disaggregate the impact along various dimensions um, by vulnerable or affected groups. And then uh, we also look at uh, sort of, you know, uh, going beyond the job losses, we uh, look at the decomposition of total working hour losses. And here, so we come up with this intensive and extensive margins of adjustment, use of the different stages of the crisis. And then there's something that, you know, I think Dr. Orbeta mentioned at the very beginning, you know, when, when work moved online, people working from home, the, the differences between people who could do it and people who couldn't do it is actually quite important. And what we have done uh, in this work is we also have constructed this teleworkability index. Um, and we look at, you know, um, um, how, what role that played in, in sort of, you know, mitigating the, mitigating the impact in terms of um, job losses. Um, and then again, finally with the policies. Uh, let me just now start presenting some of the key findings. Um, when you look at, so we are we're looking at this three, three panels here. Um, I hope everybody can see these three charts, um, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia that you see. And you look at Philippines. So the, the bars that you see there, those are, um, you know, one is employed, the green one is employment, the red one is unemployment, uh, blue is exit from the labor force. Just looking at those uh, rectangles there. So what that basically tells you is that at the height of the crisis, you know, when, when COVID-19, at the very beginning, uh, we saw a decline in employment. And of course, the people who were on, uh, who left employment went into either unemployment or they exited from the labor force. So the labor force typically includes only employed plus uh, unemployed. So you can see that at the very beginning, the, the impact was pretty severe in the uh, in the Philippines. And then it started sort of tapering off as you go as you go towards the end of 2020 and then into 2021. And this is also explained by um, uh, relaxation of the str stringency measures. You know, a lot, at the beginning, it was very difficult for folks to move around because of the lockdown. So hence, they couldn't quite enter into other types of jobs. Maybe they wanted to get into low productivity, maybe wholesale, retail, trade types of jobs. But they couldn't do that at the very beginning. So hence, you saw that massive impact. And then um, they started re-entering into some of those types of jobs or going back to their own previous jobs as well. Indonesia, Malaysia, you see, we see a slightly different picture because uh, when we compare Indonesia and, and, and Malaysia with Philippines, you see that the stringency measures in, in those two other countries wasn't as, 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 um, as well enforced as, as the Philippines. And similarly, the Thailand-Vietnam uh, story is also, also similar. 
And one thing I wanted to uh, present, and Dr. Orbeta mentioned this at the very beginning as well, in a key labor market indicators. So you've got five countries there. What's important to keep in mind is that when you look at the headline uh, indicators of the labor market, employment to population ratio, which is the EPR, unemployment rate, UR, and then LFPR, which is the labor force participation rate. Even before the pandemic, we see that you know across these th these three dimensions, especially the employment uh, rate and then the labor force participation rate. You know, Philippines, uh, the rates were lower um, to begin with. The participation rate was was lower compared to the rest of the peer, regional peers like Vietnam and, and Thailand, and then also the employment rate was also lower even pre-pandemic. But during the at the height of the pandemic, as Dr. Orveta mentioned at the top of the hour the labor force participation rate really declined tremendously. It went down all the way to 55.7, which we hadn't seen in a long, long time. So that was a massive impact. A lot of people left the labor force. And, you know, this study that we, here we showed that um, it is also because a lot of the burden of care uh, fell on women when, when COVID-19 struck. So a lot of them didn't have a choice, but had to leave the labor force altogether. Couldn't even look for a job, right, if they were laid off. So hence you see that huge impact, but then it recovers. It recovers as as the um, crisis entered into different stages. Um, when we look at the transitions, so this gets into age and sex cohorts. So job losses peaked in quarter two of 2020 with significant declines for all age and sex cohorts. More exists from the labor force following job loss among women. Uh, raising risks of lasting disruptions to their working lives. And this is something that, you know, even though we have seen recovery, a lot of women have gone back to, to the workforce. Um, one uh, point that we make in this study is that, um, you know, if they go back, yes, going back into the labor force, good news, but what type of jobs have they gone back into, right? Have they gone back into the jobs that they had previously? Maybe they had a wage and salaried employment in a private establishment, or have they gone into self-employment? or unpaid family work uh, type of situation. Of course, that has a different set of impact in terms of skills, in terms of long-term employability. So we get into this as well in the study. And you see the, the graph there in the Philippines, you know, so the, so the blue is at the, at the very, very beginning, as I mentioned, it's employment. The orange one is uh, unemployment. And then the gray is exit from the labor force. You see that across the different age cohorts, you know, you see, so it's a relatively similar picture. Um, but then when we compare men and women, slightly different story as well, because the exit bars, the gray bars are, are larger for females than for males, as I had mentioned at the, at the beginning. And the other group that was affected by the pandemic were, were, were youths. Youth share in the job losses were higher than the share in employment across most heavily affected sectors. When we just focus on the Philippines there, you see just looking at even education, right? And, and this goes back to the presentation we saw from UNICEF. Um, so if you look at the education sector, their share in youth share in employment in Q4 2019, right before the pandemic was 17%, but then their share of job losses in Q2 2020 was 51%. So it's sort of like the last in and the first out phenomenon we see in the labor market. And this is not just the Philippines, elsewhere as well, right? You are the recent hires, you're the ones who are going to let go, you're going to be a let go first. Right? And that's, we see that across countries, across sectors, it always happens. The youth tend to bear the uh, burnt of any crisis. A uh, financial crisis is a similar story. But you see that even the public sectors like education, we see this type of um, um, uh, impact uh, of the pandemic. And the question we also asked was, is there evidence of a more detachment among women? And the short answer is no. A lot of them have gone back. But I'll show you in a second, they've gone back into lower quality employment. So the sectoral impact, and this is a very important story that I wanted to highlight also, is that, you know, um, the mobility restrictions played a key role in terms of uh, whether or not um, uh, sectoral reallocation even took place. When you look at the three sectors I've, I've highlighted there, agriculture, manufacturing, accommodation, and food service. So typically what ends up happening is the agriculture sector plays a key role in absorbing the workers who have left the other sectors, right? And in a way that, you know, when we think of, formal versus informal employment. And Dr. Orbeta also mentioned this. Informal employment tends to be your, uh, it, it absorbs the shock, right? Like a, something like a COVID-19 shock or, or, or an economic shock. And in this case, actually, what we saw in the Philippines, the first country that you see on the left-hand side, you know, there was a decline in employment, even in the agriculture sector. 
right? We didn't see an increase and this improves over time. And if I, if I were to show you, you know, Q3 2020, Q4 2020, Q1 2021, you'll see, you know, you can definitely see a recovery in the agriculture sector. And actually in 2021, agriculture sector grew in terms of jobs. Um, so again, but at the height of the pandemic, it wasn't able to absorb uh, the, the folks who left uh, who left uh, the, their employment in other sectors. Similarly, in manufacturing, manufacturing was heavily impacted. Factories shut down, so it was heavily impacted. You saw the negative number there. And ac accommodation and food service, this was sort of, it required person-to-person -person contact. So a lot of those uh, businesses were closed. Hence, we saw a decline in jobs in that sector. And, you know, uh, the uh, recovery did take place. So what happened was, you know, um, the as we went in terms of, you know, of course, you know, some sectors were heavily impacted, some other sectors less so, but then, you know, they started recovering. You see the Q4 2020, as I had just mentioned, and you look at that dark line there, which is the information and communication uh, sector, right? And not, no surprises there, that sector recovered much faster um, uh, in by the time we got to Q4 uh, 2020, and you look at other countries. The stories are there. There are diff differences, but you know, differences by sector and, and by country. But more or less, the recovery did take place. But some sectors didn't quite recover, even by Q4 uh, 2020. Um, so, as 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 I had indicated, you know, the, when I was talking about the recovery, the so the employment recovery that we saw in the second half of 2020 was in lower quality jobs. Uh, so movements into self-employment and unpaid family work, which are your typically informal sector work. And you look at this uh, this table here, you see that if you just um, zoom in on self-employed and unpaid family work, you see there's a lot of growth in that type of work, right? When you look at the status of employment in, in the labor force surveys, we see that actually a lot of folks went into that. And that's not typically good type of employment. And... You know, when we just look at job losses, it tends to sort of underestimate the impact of the pandemic. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, so we call that the extensive margin of adjustment, right? So basically, people, somebody's let go. So uh, that's what we count. And we see that in, in the unemployment rate and, and job loss figures. But what we don't see is folks who still have their employment, have their jobs, but their hours were reduced, right? that also has an impact on their earnings. So what we did here in, in this table, you can see that we decompose working hour losses uh, between, in, you know, then here, intensive margins of adjustment in, in the share of intensive margins of adjustment that was used, you see that across all sectors, actually, especially in the Philippines, uh, it, it was used across all these sectors. So hours were reduced for a lot of workers. Um, and then we tried to look at, you know, uh, correlation with different um, different uh, variables here. So basically, teleworkability uh, is one. MSME share is another one. Temporary worker share, wage employment share, and low skills share. And you can imagine that here the findings are not you know sort of you know conclusive. But what you see is that across the board, of course, if there's te if teleworkability was possible, then intensive margins of adjustment, you know, would, uh, wouldn't be used, right? So the people can actually work from home. Um, but then, you know, you go into MSME and then temporary worker share, low school share again. Here, a lot of people were actually let go rather than hours being, being reduced. Um, now, uh, I wanted to look at the skills. Um, so when you look at the differential impact um, across different groups of workers, the pandemic hurt low skill workers, but also middle skill workers whose jobs were already at risk of automation even before the pandemic. And you see this across the uh, five countries we have looked at. Um, and again, you know, the, when we sort of further look at this differential impact across uh, workers, on account workers uh, were impacted, informal sector workers suffered major job losses, temporary and casual workers, and migrant workers. And you can see that the inequities that were there even before the pandemic were worsened because of the pandemic. Um, um, so what policies have mitigated the impact? When you look at the social protection and labor markets um, here, so the, the graph you're looking at, this is showing the first one on the left-hand side, social protection and labor market programs, coverage, adequacy, and benefit uh, incidents to the poorest. If you look at this, the social safety net programs, these are more common, right? These are sort of your social transfers, uh, uh, conditional cash transfers. These are sort of your more common ones. And there were... Uh, you know, this was the prevalence before the pandemic, 
And when you look at social insurance programs, which are contributory scheme in many cases, but those were not as prevalent. But when you look at the uh, the, the adequacy of benefits tends to be actually much better, of course, uh, because it's, if it's a contributory scheme, scheme especially. And then the labor market programs, there's a bit of a variation across countries. When you look and cover, uh, you, uh, when you look at these uh, three types, the most common ones was the social safety net. Um, and the right hand side, this uh, data is from from the ILO, where we look at you know proportion of population protected in at least one area of social protection. Again, uh, depending on how you define that, uh, you get different sets of figures. But generally speaking, that's the picture we get uh, for Southeast Asia. Well, what I wanted to show you is that you know the social assistance programs and particularly the lar large scale cash transfer programs played an in integral role in the social response of many of these countries. And you know of the Pontoweed uh, program in the Philippines, but when you look at Indonesia, Pekaha is the one that actually was, um, you know, provided the cash assistance that was needed. Uh, and across, you know, in Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, there were other types of programs there, there as well. And when you look at the adequacy of benefits of, for large scale uh, emergency cash transfers, you see that some of them were, um, you know, the, the, the benefit uh, was more adequate than others. You can see on the right-hand side there. Um, and ways and training subsidies also played an important role uh, in terms of country response, but the coverage again was, uh, was limited. So as you can imagine, this work was done at, at 2020, you know, uh, 2021. So we looked at that sort of a peak crisis period. So we're actually continuing looking at the data and coming up with a part two of this of this study, and as I said at the beginning, we try to we'll try to include Cambodia, Laos, and and, and others as well. But what we have done with this uh, with this work is that it has fed into some of our lending programs, especially in Indonesia and the Philippines, the two countries I've worked in for, for the most part for the last few years. Here we have actually used some of this uh, diagnostics, some of these findings into designing our lending program, whether it's a policy-based loan or whether it's an investment project, we've actually used findings from this study. So this study is available online. Um, so please go take a look. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. With that, uh, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Katiwada, for your presentation, for highlighting the uneven impact of the impacts of the pandemic and the importance of social protection that's accessible to all workers. Now it's uh, time for our panel discussion. Again, while we're having the panel discussion, participants from Zoom and Facebook may leave their comments and questions for our speakers and panelists. We are honored to be joined by four practitioners and experts, and let me um, introduce them one by one. We have uh, Dr. Elizabeth King, on resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, managing editor of the Journal of Development Effectiveness, and adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. She serves on the boards of the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, Room to Read, and Education Commission Asia. She's technical advisor to Achidna Giving and the World Bank's Africa Gender Innovation Lab and a judge of the Yidan Prize for Education Research. She was the World Bank's Global Director for Policy and Strategic Issues in Education and Acting Vice President for Human Development Sectors. She has published journal articles, books, book chapters, and blogs on human capital, labor markets, and gender. She received her PhD in economics from Yale University. Mr. Juan Miguel Luz is the president of a quality education design company and adjunct professor at the Asian Institute of Management. Over the past two decades, he had held various management positions in different sectors. The government, such as the presidential management staff and Department of Education, non-governmental organizations, such as the Philippine Business for Social Progress, private sector, academe like the Asian Institute of Management and the De La Salle University, and international organizations like the APEC Business Advisory Council. He, said, he is an author or editor of five books on corporate community relations in Asia and on education management. He has a master in public administration degree from the John F. Kennedy of School Government, Harvard University, where he was an Edward S. Mason Fellow in International Development. We also have Ms. Lovelane Basiliote, is the Executive Director of the Philippine Business for Education, a nonprofit organization founded in 2006 as the business community's response to the need for greater education and economy alignment. She is also an independent director of a fintech startup. 
Ms. Basiliote is a human capital development and education specialist with significant experience in nonprofit management, program management, public policy, and communications. She has a master's degree from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in political science from the Ateneo de Manila University. And we also have Mr. Ham Amir Hamza Jilani. He is an economist and social sector specialist at the Asian Development Bank. He has an extensive experience working on the design, development, and evaluation of social protection, human development, and women's empowerment projects. His research and operational experience focuses on social assistance and cash transfers, economic inclusion programs, basic education, and the use of digital technology solutions to improve public service delivery. Prior to joining the Asian Development Bank, he worked at the International Food Policy Research Institute as an applied microeconomist. He holds undergraduate degrees in economics and finance from the Australian National University and a Master of Public Policy specializing in, in applied microeconomics and international development from Georgetown University. So the first question for our panel will be for Dr. King. So laws and programs that seek to reduce inequalities in access to education are already present in the Philippines for a long time. And despite this, we observe that the human capital index, which is reported by the World Bank, remains low and huge disparities in human capital indicators across socioeconomic groups, gender and regions have persisted. So what do you think are the major challenges faced by the Philippines for not being able to realize the goals of these existing policies? And how can these challenges be overcome? First of all, let, let me thank, um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Petya, but also PIDS, uh, special Dr. Arbeta and uh, the APPC for inviting me to, uh, to this panel session. And thank you for the previous speakers. I've learned a lot about the impact of, of COVID uh, on different aspects of, uh, of, of life in the Philippines. But you're, you're absolutely right that over the past decades, the Philippines adopted an ambitious national social agenda in health, in education, in social protection. Um, and if implemented well, funded adequately and monitored assiduously, that agenda could, 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 could put the Philippines back onto a road of robust human development. However, any indicators, both uh, formal uh, evidence, but also evidence from people whom I have interviewed for a study that I did, have, sh have, have uh, show that the biggest weakness really is not the ideas, not the design of the, of the policies per se, uh, that many of the ideas are actually quite modern and forward looking and, 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 and really responsive to the situation in the Philippines. The failure has been about implementation, about consistency, Implementation about fidelity of implementation, fidelity to the design and to the principles of the policies, and also adequate funding. So, in in many in many cases, in many of the policies that I've looked at, let's say from the 70s, even modern ideas, sound ideas, good good policies, fail because there's no follow up. There's, there's there really no um, specific and sound design for implementation of the policies. Uh, the policies are made at the national level, but fail at the local level. And many times also uh, are not funded adequate, adequately. And when there's a change of administration, a change of leaders in sectors, many of those policies are abandoned so there isn't really the, the, the design that the agenda, so the social agenda is, is really not, has not been consistent, not been coordinated across all sectors of the government and not 
uh, not always and not even evaluate it so that we, we would know which ones failed and which ones succeeded, why they failed or why they succeeded. So I would say that's in short the story of the social agenda in the Philippines. And your your point about um, part of your question, which is about uh, the social justice and social in inequality. It's very hard to, to get um, really good evidence from areas. And, and by evidence, I don't mean just collecting data, which NSO does adequately and well. Uh, it's, it's really understanding at that level, what is the impact of specific policies? And I think unless we really go at the level where what they say is the, the, the wheel, the tire hits the road, where, where we can really tell whether it's successful or not, we, that's, we don't provide, we don't give enough detail of what, what's happened to policy implementation at that level. And really, if we want to correct the social inequalities in our in our country, in the Philippines, we will have to really pay attention to how the poorest, how indigenous peoples, how people in the most remote of the Philippines, in Guam, including Mindanao, uh, how they're doing. Uh, if if we if we if we do not pay enough attention to how the implementation is going in the low, lowest levels of government, in barangays, local local municipalities. We will not be able to sustain a successful uh, uh, a human capital agenda. This is, I think, where uh, many countries in the region uh, have have been more successful. It is because there is a a uh, consistency across administration, fidelity to the policy, um, not a uh, frequent uh, churning of, of uh, the leaders in the sectors, um, and ad adequate funding. So we, we can learn a lot from our neighboring countries. Uh, you mentioned the Advanced Human Capital Index. The Philippines is uh, just a little bit ahead of Indonesia, but well below Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, and of course South Korea. So I would say I would let me stop there and and pick up again uh, after the other uh, panelists have spoken. Thank you, Dr. King. So that's the take is the design. The problem is not the design, but actually it's the concern on the implementation. So adequate funding, continuous um, evaluation of how these um, policies are done so that we can find tune that's lacking here in the in the Philippines. So that's something that we can uh, learn from other countries. So thank yeah. you, Dr. King. So we'll uh, now ask uh, uh, Mr. Luz. So uh, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Feingold, now the COVID-19 crisis exacerbated the already pre-existing inequalities in education. Uh, nonetheless, um, international institutions like the World Bank, the UNICEF, and the UNESCO have uh, indicated that uh, the crisis can also be used as an opportunity to make the education system more resilient, more equitable, and more efficient in delivering learning for all. So how do you think this can be applied to the Philippine context and experience? Okay. You know, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you to UNICEF and ADB for, for making the, the presentations earlier. Um, you know, uh, uh, AIM is a management school. And in management, um, uh, we look at crisis and opportunity as uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, in fact, in the Chinese language, the, uh, the word crisis is composed of two characters and one character uh, represents danger and the other represents opportunity, weiji. Um, but in fact, opportunity is uh, literally translated as a turning point. Okay, so um, 
if we want to talk about taking advantage of crisis and turning it into opportunity, um, then one needs uh, to have uh, three things, an innate intelligence, uh, skill, and what we call grit or staying power. And all of these, I think, are products of education and upbringing. So not everyone uh, is in a position to take crisis and turn it into opportunity. Uh, there are those who are able to do that. And what we'd like to do is be able to, to have uh, develop more of our people to be able to do that in, uh, in future. So, you know, it's, it was brought up that even before the pandemic um, and even before the, ended, the ending of the extended school closures, uh, and distance learning mode. Um, you know, our education was already uh, in crisis. Um, I'm involved with Philippine Business for Education as it's one of our panelist members, uh, Love Basilote. And, um, and here we were already saying that uh, even before the pandemic, we were saying that the education system is in crisis. And, there are a number of things that were pointing to that. You know, kids were coming to school, but the levels of learning were low. Uh, there was a high dropout rate, although this was uh, declining slightly before the pandemic. Um, and you might say that uh, uh, people, uh, teachers and uh, school heads in our education system were, um, uh, had uh, coping mechanisms that would allow them to uh, to deal with pressures, except that uh, when you take a look at the coping, um, you know, I was uh, we were worried that what was uh, what we were calling as coping mechanisms was actually the lowering of standards to allow for more kids to be able to pass through the system, even if they were not meeting standards. So um, we had this crisis even before the pandemic. And then uh, what's happened in the last uh, couple of years is uh, uh, two concepts that really are now hitting us in the face, um, what the World Bank calls learning poverty and uh, learning loss, which was mentioned by uh, Izzy in his presentation earlier. So, uh, you know, what this pandemic is making us do is it's, it's, uh, it's forcing us to make changes in the way we do things, uh, in the way our curriculum uh, is being designed, um, in our teaching methods, in the way uh, we're managing our classes as we get into face-to-face -face schooling again, and uh, in assessment, which we really haven't done too much of lately. And we, we really need to, to take a hard look at where our kids are today. So the question that's asked is, uh, will this make our system more resilient? Will it be more equitable? Will it be more efficient? Uh, and I guess the, the short answer to that is uh, we're gonna have to, to, to wait a little bit because it's only the start of face-to-face -face schooling in the last three weeks. And what I've seen uh, from my visits to schools, just to see uh, how they're doing, is um, when I talk to teachers, um, they talk about coping. Um, they're feeling a lot of pressure getting back to face to face. There are a lot more rules and regulations now with the way they're doing things. And, and frankly, uh, even after two years of distance education, uh, blended learning is still something that a lot of our teachers have got to get their heads around and get uh, build their skill level up. So um, they are coping and um, they are trying to find uh, ways to
to deal with it. But you know, uh, coping is not necessarily resilience. You know, resilience is about uh, springing back from some kind of difficult situation to recovery that is going into growth. And um, right now our teachers in our schools are going back uh, to face to face and they're trying to figure out what this new growth and learning is going to look like. Um, and so it's uh, coping at uh, uh, best uh, what we're trying to do is uh, trying to build resilience and we, we, we still need to, to see how that's being done. Uh, in terms of equity, uh, this is really much more of a challenge, um, especially among the lower income families, um, not only in formal education, but even in early childhood development and in the formative years. Uh, you know, one of our problems, I think in the last couple of years is uh, without face-to-face -face, uh, learning, I think uh, our, our kinder grades one, grades two, where uh, early reading and early math require a good deal of face-to-face -face instruction, I think they struggle and parents uh, have had a difficult time uh, coping up with that. So I think uh, what uh, we're going to have to to uh, study really hard with the Department of Education in the next months is uh, uh, our kids really coming back to school. Um, right now, our enrollment levels are not, I believe, are not as high as they they were particularly in the private schools. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, DepEd gives the first three months a chance for enrollments to come up. So uh, we are going to have to study that quite uh, closely. And lastly, on efficiency, you know, traditionally, um, uh, DepEd has looked at efficiency as the judicious use of resources. But there's really a a better and different way of looking at efficiency. And that is um, as, uh, through uh, dropouts and those being left behind. Because uh, if you take a look at efficiency, uh, those who enter the system versus those who uh, stay in the system, uh, those who drop out is really a form of inefficiency. And as we go through the years, we're going to have to watch um, what happens with the dropout rates. Will it uh, increase? Will it, uh, will it diminish as we hope it would uh, or it would stay even? Um, so uh, we're looking right now. And um, the, these next uh, couple of months, I think, are going to be critical in terms of how the formal education system will tell us, are we resilient, are we efficient, and so on. Thank you, Mr. Lu. So it's a matter of uh, continuous monitoring, seeing how can we adjust, taking into account the welfare of the students, the parents, and the teachers, all the participants in the education system. So just want to follow up on your point about that dropout uh, rate. So you mentioned that the dropout uh, rate has uh, increased uh, during the pandemic and they are among these school leavers are among the children left behind uh, in the education system so what do you think uh, can the government do and possibly other sectors of the society to encourage the students to come back especially those uh, especially men if these uh, leave, uh, leavers that being uh, able to come back coming from uh, low-income households yeah I think, well, first of all, I think there are different uh, segments of the basic education population. Um, for example, if you take a look at the, the uh, lower primary, which is the kinder to grade three, um, uh, those are really the, uh, for many of them, they're the first time uh, school uh, goers. And, you know, they're starting their 
education journey uh, at the height of the of the pandemic and the school uh, shutdown and and having to do face to face right away and I think what it it uh, it made it difficult for parents um, to deal with kids um, that way I think uh, for that particular group. Um, I think the biggest incentive for that is uh, uh, really school feeding as a way of incentivizing parents to bring kids to school. Um, for older kids, uh, there are other uh, in-school activities that can be done. And certainly as you get into high school, I'm a great believer that um, for many of the high school kids, the incentives, especially for boys to come to school, has really been uh, the presence of uh, extracurricular activities. So, so there are different incentives to, to try to bring kids to school. But for the very, very young kids, uh, early primary, I think uh, school feeding uh, and those kinds of health and nutrition programs will encourage parents to bring their school, uh, their kids to school. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Du. So it's a matter of thinking of uh, ways depending on the, the uh, education level of uh, the students. So where they're coming from, what would more in incentivize them to go back to school? Actually, the, the, the school feeding uh, aspect is one of the, uh, I think it's one of the highly uh, cited um, uh, reasons on why uh, students were not uh, able to really benefit uh, from remote learning, especially from low-income households. It, 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 it is something that na nawala sa kanila, the school feeding. So that's one of the re, uh, probably one of the reasons why face-to-face -face classes are highly encouraged, especially for uh, low-income households. Yes. So thank you, Mr. Luz. So we'll now go from the point of view of uh, advocacy. Ad yes. Yes. Do, do you mind yes. if I just add? Yes. Do you mind if I just add to that? Because I want yes. to pick, I want to pick up the point of uh, Mr. I think it was Mr. Katiwada who did that, who said that. I want to talk about the effect of COVID on labor labor market uh, labor market outcomes, and I think it's it's thinking about this intersectionally, you know, not just education, but also what's happening to the jobs of parents. And I, th I think thinking about the job of parents in this case is one way to actually encourage more education of the young children and to address that. If we, if we can address the loss of jobs and loss of jobs partly because, possibly because of health, or even death. That is so. We, we let so I think we 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 incentivize through the school system, but we also need to take care of what's what's what has happened to the family economics during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, greater assistance, for example, to the family. Um, uh, uh, cash transfers for um, early childhood development, as was suggested by, by Mr. Katiwada as well. So there are, that's what I think how we should be treating the recovery uh, from the pandemic is more, more holistically. Thank you, Dr. King. So we have seen from the pandemic that the low income households, you know, given the massive job losses and income losses, they would be the ones who could easily fall into food insecurity. So they're also likely the ones who would pull out their children from school. So that's where the importance of social protection is to protect the workers and consequently protect the children of uh, these workers and having them to continue on the education system. So thank you, uh, Dr. King, for that uh, additional uh, input. So now we'll call uh, on uh, Ms. Basiliote from the point of view of an advocacy group from PBED. So we've seen that uh, from the presentation of uh, Mr. Feingold, it's just uh, showing um, empirical evidence that corroborate 
the already anecdotal evidence of deteriorating quality of higher education in the Philippines. But it's not just that. Uh, international assessments also show that there's a, really a gap between the performance of uh, students who are more affluent versus less affluent. So as a, as a advocacy group that um, promotes this um, inclusive no, education, no, what role does uh, PBED uh, has on um, um, promote advancing uh, these um, policies that will ensure not just to have uh, inclusive uh, uh, access to, quant to the quantity of education, but also the quality of education. Thanks, thanks, um, Dr. Epetia. Um, thanks, PIDS, for the opportunity to be with you today, um, and also to our speakers and our panelists. Um, it's an honor to be on the same virtual stage with you. Um, just to your question, so Philippine Business for Education, or PBED, um, as we call it here in the Philippines, um, we our mission is simple. Basically, it's it, this: we work with the with the private sector um, and the business community to push for education education um, for an education system that enables every Filipino to lead productive lives and contribute to national development. So actually implicit to our mission is this whole idea of inclusion and uh, equality and equity. Um, we have been pushing as an advocacy group, we have been pushing for you know greater resources um, channeled towards education, like what uh, Dr. King mentioned, also making sure that the budget that is actually allocated for education is um, used, utilized for programs and activities that actually move the learning needle. And as an advocacy group, we don't just push for policies, we also monitor, right? We And that's why actually, uh, as what um, uh, Mr. Luz mentioned earlier, we have been calling um, for greater attention on this learning crisis because it's not just anecdotal data actually. We have been seeing time um, over the years the declining um, numbers in our national achievement test scores. So there is anecdotal but there's also you know statistical data showing really that the, that the learning crisis is getting worse and worse. And so um, uh, and so we, we also actually um, yeah monitor the performance of the system and then draw attention towards the things that we think are important. Now, um, I guess just to kind of connect it as well, not just to Issy's presentation, but also to Samir's presentation about, you know, labor market, because that's actually what we, that is our other, um, uh, what we call programmatic vertical in, in PBED, which is workforce development. And because we think that, you know, education isn't, isn't just for education's sake. It is really to you know promote social mobility to make sure that people's lives improve because they are given um, quality education and so on the on the workforce development aspect right we are very concerned that this learning crisis has in a way translated into greater vulnerability of our youth um, when it comes to shocks whenever there is a crisis as Samir said they're the first in uh, last in first out. Um, and then during a crisis, even though um, what um, Mr. Luz was saying that you know there is there is um, there's danger, but also there's opportunity. We actually don't um, we don't um, maximize the opportunity that the crisis presents because in a crisis in COVID, when there was you know everything is shutting down, um, we are we were also not um, we also did not invest. In, in the training of our youth, it could have been an opportunity for us to retrain our youth, bring back out of school youth to do, you know, technical vocational training, for example, which we which we did in 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 PBED, um, to make sure right that they are retrained, reskilled, so that when the economy opens up, they would be the first in also right. They don't get crowded out in the crowded out in the labor market, um, and so. I think, you know, in terms of, of human capital development um, and really investing in our people, I completely agree with, with, with Dr. King. Um, we have not been putting resources, enough resources into our people um, and not just in education, but just, you know, um, in, in general, right? We, their malnutrition, for example, is very high in the Philippines. One in three five-year-olds is, um, uh, is, is malnourished. Uh, so they're not ready to learn. Um, 
and the CCT programs, um, you know, like they, they have proved to to um, work everywhere else and even in the Philippines. But there's now talks of maybe like contracting it. We are not putting enough resources in it. But then, you know, more resources could really like help improve people's lives. So um, uh, all that to say that, you know, we need to we need to invest in our people more. We need to make sure that those investments are actually going in the right programs and we monitor the programs well. Um, and then when when they are not being done well, we need to, you know, make noise and 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 really like push for these changes. And so, yeah, as an advocacy group, um, we work with organizations like PIDS um, uh, and and other partners in the education space to really, yeah, shine a light on the problems, but also work together, right, on the solutions that we think would be helpful for the for the system. Thank you very much, Ms. Basiliote. I think the, 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 the good part about what you said is it does all the sectors working together and making sure that um, the education system is well-funded and not just well-funded, but making sure that uh, the funds are going into the proper projects that uh, would uh, enable this uh, the education to be more accessible, not just, uh, not just in terms of quantity, but also reaching quality education uh, for all um, um, students in our uh, society. So you mentioned about the youth, which is actually um, um, highlighted also by Dr. Katiwada, having been uh, um, one of the, the group, one of the group that have been um, affected heavily by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So last thing first out. So um, you mentioned the importance of the defect. Uh, but uh, what's what we've seen from a study from the PIDS that there's not the, the, the take up of, um, of um, this event among the youth is not as high. It's not reaching its full potential. So what do you think are the barriers from why the youth are not uh, taking up these uh, programs? And what do you think are uh, the things that we can do? in order to overcome these uh, barriers. Yeah, no, so that's a really great study, by the way. And uh, if I may just plug it, that's actually a, that was a study that we did together with you, yes. right? So yes. I'm very proud of that study because I think key to solving a problem is knowing what the problem is. And so we really needed data to understand what the, <laughs> what the situation was, right? And so to your question, the, the study showed that there were four basically key barriers, right? So the first one is resources, funds. They cannot afford tuition, um, which was to me surprising because TESDA could not really utilize all of its scholarship funds. Um, so, you know, there, there was a bit of a kind of mismatch there. The second one is no information. The youth just do not know what the training opportunities are out there. So there is, there was, you know, or there is um, information asymmetry. The third one is on housework and care giving duties. And actually, um, I think Samir and, and Dr. King um, uh, touched on, on this point, right? We also need, when, when you think about education, you cannot just, and, and human capital, you cannot just pinpoint or like zero in on education. You need to look at the intersectional um, aspects of human capital development. And, you know, when we want women to enter the labor force or to go into training, we need to necessarily think about childcare for example, or what are the, so like those wraparound, wraparound support, right? Um, that that uh, people need to, to enter um, the labor market or, or go into training. Um, and then the last one is, you know, because um, they don't, they, they can't afford the opportunity cost. So they are now looking for, for work, right? So they don't pursue um, education. So um, I think that in terms of how we can solve these barriers right one i think we need to look at the efficiency well first rethink the way tesla scholarships are actually even um funded and value valuated right now i think on average a tesla scholarship is about eight thousand pesos in tuition or something like on average um i could be wrong i, I need to get the, to the data more but when we when we are implementing now our our training program for the youth that actually almost guarantee 100 percent jobs after the training program our costing is really um 
as high as 80,000 pesos because it includes the wrap around costs that I was I was talking about earlier. So maybe rethinking the test um, funding so that, you know, the, the training, the, the voucher, the scholarship actually not only attracts, but also make sure that people re um, stay in the program and then graduate and then get a job, right? Um, on information, we can definitely do more there. Um, I think we don't do enough when it comes to sourcing. So it's not enough to just post on Facebook, oh, we have a scholarship program, but then really going to where these youth are and then um, and then targeting them with our, you know, information um, campaigns. And then, yeah, as I said, on house housework and caregiving duties, um, employers also need to do more work here, right? It's not just enough to say, hey, our doors are open, you can go back to work now. Um, but then how do we also maybe adjust um, the start of a of a um, of a work day right because some some women probably would prefer their kid to like send their kids to school but and could find um, other other supports for for child care in the afternoon but not in the morning so I mean even that like I think employers can also you know have a have something to to do there to encourage more women to to join the workforce or to start a, a training program yeah and then um in terms of working or like seeking work um it's very important that yeah we really look at human capital not just from an uh, human capital um development not just from an education or social standpoint but even really also from an economic standpoint right how do we generate more jobs how do we generate good jobs because samir also made the distinction right between good jobs and i think what the ilo call bad jobs those informal um no contract no social protection so how do we also encourage um the economy and the private sector to really pro to offer good jobs and and so that people are are um they're also they also feel right that the investments that they have made in themselves um actually do have concrete returns right so um, yeah, so the the economic side of things should also be looked at. I think you, Ms. Basiliot, it's, it's just a good point. That's taking holistic view. So not just a piecemeal view on um, how to address these problems. There are various problems, but there are also many sector uh, actors in uh, the society that should work together. You know, not just uh, pointing out who should do what. No, so it's it's a, it's a it's really a cooperation collaboration of uh, government private sector, civil society, and international organizations. So I think, uh, Dr. King, would you like to add on that? I think you also worked on uh, gender and care economy. Yes, yes, I have. But actually, the point I really wanted to pick up from what uh, Ms. Pasalote was saying is about the kind of the kind of skills that we need Tesla to be focusing on. So sure, technical skills, vocational skills are very important. But as I believe Mr. Feingold also was saying, is that we need to make sure that uh, the training, the education and the training are also about improving the decision-making skills and the critical thinking skills of of, of the youth of the students because the jobs that are you know the world of the world of jobs the world of work has changed a lot with technology with increased globalization so the routine the manual the routine cognitive those jobs are being replaced by jobs that require more decision making skills more critical thinking, more risk taking. So the social emotional skills that was mentioned earlier by Mr. Feingold are actually very important skills. So we need to, when we start to think about that, what Tesla might do better, I think it should be not, it should be how to also improve the growth mindset of students, how to improve their decision-making skills, their critical thinking skills, their problem solving skills. Thank you, Dr. King. So it's not just, I mean, this changing labor market, it's not just the hard skills or technical skills. It's also the soft skills, soft skills and social emotional skills that should be also that the early childhood development. Them, yeah. Yes. Just don't call them soft skills. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> They're actually harder skills to teach, I think. Yes. They're yes. harder because mm -hmm. you can't you can't you can't go to the blackboard and just, you know, yes. put some notes down. It, it's about how changing how students think, how they look at the situation and find solutions. So I don't think they're soft skills at all. I think they're the harder skills to teach. I think that's a, that's a, that's a good term, actually, harder skills. I really and, those are, yes. and those are skills that have to be, we've got to start teaching those at a much younger age. That, I, that's a really good point. No, Mr. Even in the Mr. lower primary years. Yes, Mr. Uh, Professor Heckman, actually, on his, uh, um, main, uh, he was our main speaker. Uh, in the first webinar of the APPC, he highlighted that uh, supporting the, the social emo emotional skills of kids at a very early age, even before going back to school, because that will have a long lasting impact you know, for the well being of uh, these children. So, just to uh, also, uh, Dr. King also mentioned a while ago you know, the importance of um, really protecting the income of workers. Now, especially during this pandemic, no, it's not just protecting the uh, income of the workers, but also having the financial means to con let students continue on uh, to school. So for this question is for Mr. Jelani, so regarding social uh, protection programs. So one of your research focus is on economic uh, inclusion programs. Uh, can you briefly uh, describe uh, what economic inclusion programs are? And what role can these programs play in building resilience to shocks and promoting sustainable employment and livelihoods, especially for the disadvantaged uh, workers, like the vulnerable and marginalized, marginalized groups and uh, informal uh, workers? And then as a regional development bank you know, working in ADB, what role does ADB play in promoting such programs? Great. Uh, well, thank you for this, uh, this important question. So. Um, in, in general, uh, economic inclusion programs, uh, also known as um, cash plus programming or uh, the graduation approach, um, they're an innovation in social protection that build on the very strong foundation of social assistance, such as cash transfers, um, with a holistic set of poverty reduction interventions. So the basic idea is that um, because poverty is multidimensional, and it represents multiple facets of deprivation beyond just uh, limited income, no single intervention in isolation will be able to address it alone. And so economic inclusion programs uh, recognize this and, and they combine social assistance uh, with asset transfers and livelihoods development, uh, business uh, and skills training, uh, financial inclusion, uh, and social empowerment and psychosocial support to help poor and vulnerable households um, find a sustainable pathway out of poverty. Um, now, these programs have been piloted, tested, or scaled in over 200 countries now around the world um, with rigorous uh, impact evaluations, including by Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, um, confirming positive impacts of these programs on a range of outcomes, including consumption and poverty and food security, um, savings, um, yeah, employment, uh, women's empowerment, and increasingly more recently uh, uh, on resilience to shocks. Uh, so an ADB supported pilot of um, the graduation approach or these economic inclusion programs in the Philippines from 2018 to 2020, I believe, um, enrolled uh, about 1,800 households in the province uh, of Negros Occidental uh, into the economic inclusion program, provided them with um, assets based on careful market assessments, uh, along with the other interventions that I mentioned. And what we found was that during the pandemic, households who had access um, to these economic inclusion programs saw an increase uh, in their resilience uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic across a range of dimensions, including uh, food security, financial security, and mental health compared to uh, control group households. Uh, and, and so, um, so this, was, uh, this was a sort of a, a rapid evaluation that we did 
uh, at the height of lockdowns in 2020 within the Philippines. Um, we then did a, an endline evaluation of this program last year and, and again found that actually the program had fairly substantial impacts in terms of uh, consumption, uh, in terms of diversifying livelihoods, uh, and also improving savings and, and food security. Uh, so ADB is now supporting countries across the Asia Pacific uh, explore how they can ta uh, tailor and adapt graduation uh, and economic inclusion programs to their unique uh, contexts. And so we're looking at uh, similar programs uh, in Mongolia, in, in India, uh, and, and uh, also exploring this in, in Cambodia and other uh, developing member countries. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Jelani. So these economic inclusion programs are really protecting you know, the livelihoods of, uh, of workers and having other uh, beneficial effects to the households. Like you mentioned, uh, protecting their consumption, assuring that they have uh, food security, which is really important at, uh, during uh, a, a crisis as large as uh, this one that we experienced in the COVID-19. Uh, so, but uh, following up on uh, that, uh, your answer, uh, Mr. Jelani, uh, admittedly, uh, the social protection system has um, faced um, challenges as well you know, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So what do you think were the major challenges and issues when it comes to delivering social protection in developing countries uh, like the Philippines? And despite these challenges and issues, do you think there are still uh, reform opportunities moving forward as countries aim to achieve inclusive recovery, you know, getting out of the pandemic? Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, you're absolutely right. I think the COVID pandemic uh, magnified um, many existing vulnerabilities and in, uh, inequalities across the world, um, as well as gaps in social protection systems. Uh, now, certainly, I think social protection played a very important role in protecting both lives and livelihoods. Uh, and recent evaluations have started to document the positive effect of income support measures uh, and cash transfer programs on, um, uh, in terms of mitigating the socioeconomic impacts of the crisis. But, but as you mentioned, these did not come without their uh, set of challenges. Um, cash transfers, for example, reached over 1.3 billion individuals uh, globally, but the average coverage rate of the population in, in many low-income countries was still in single digits. Um, and so low coverage was a major challenge across uh, countries. And in fact, coverage of certain groups, uh, particularly those in the informal sector, was already low, uh, with most informal workers not covered by any form of adequate social protection prior to the crisis, um, because they were rendered ineligible uh, under traditional means-tested programs or for formal uh, programs like paid sick leave and unemployment benefits. Um, this is despite the fact that they make up uh, nearly 78% of the employed population in, in Southeast Asia uh, and higher often in, in, in certain economies and are a vital part of economic activity and contribute to GDP. Um, Women were also not adequately covered uh, despite facing increased risks due to informality, um, unpaid care work and gender-based violence. Um, coverage of maternity cash benefits, for example, ranged between three and 30% and, uh, in our region. The second, uh, and I think closely related challenge was related to underdeveloped systems, uh, delivery systems for identifying, registering, enrolling and uh, delivering swift payments to impacted households. Uh, countries, including the Philippines, had to rely on existing, uh, sometimes uh, outdated socioeconomic registries and databases to identify beneficiaries. Um, but the pandemic was unique in terms of its impact on urban and peri-urban populations and those uh, at, at the middle of the income distribution who were not always captured uh, in these registries. Um, so similarly, lack of access to bank accounts and digital wallets um, excluded certain groups. And a third challenge was, I think, the low fiscal space uh, to provide adequate social protection to all the vulnerable groups that were impacted by the crisis. Uh, so this meant that programs like cash transfers were often short in duration and uh, uncertain in extension uh, and were often not sufficient to counter the foregone labor income. 
Um, and finally, I think the COVID pandemic revealed that many social protection systems were not as adaptive and shock responsive uh, as they can be. Um, so now just very quickly, the final part of your question, um, I think the pandemic has built some momentum for strengthening social protection systems. Uh, it certainly has um, generated demand and awareness for adaptive and shock responsive social protection, uh, including the need for on-demand registration systems, uh, the importance of interoperable uh, databases uh, that are linked with early warning systems and um, disaster risk management systems, and also the need for expanding digital financial inclusion. Um, we have started to see countries now investing in efforts to strengthen and better integrate their delivery systems, including their ID systems, uh, their socioeconomic registries, uh, and also their m and &E systems. Uh, there is some potential appetite within the broader government machinery in, in certain countries to consider the necessary reforms uh, for sustainable financing of social protection programs moving forward, uh, including tax collection, uh, reallocation of certain resources, or improved fiscal management. Um, and finally, while I think that uh, domestic resource constraints may restrict uh, transformational changes overnight, there are opportunities to strengthen social prote protection systems gradually, um, leverage social protection as an instrument to support, uh, for example, climate mitigation and adaptation, and explore innovative solutions such as economic inclusion programs or other employment generating and empowerment programs um, uh, across, uh, across the region. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Jalani. So the, the, the problems, the concerns on the social protection systems are already there, even before, even, uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. So what the COVID-19 pandemic did is to really explicitly uh, more, uh, recognize, we recognize more you know, the, the, need, the, the need for social protection, the speed of delivery, identifying who, uh, uh, who would need this, and as well as given the, you mentioned low fiscal space. So given the low fiscal space, especially among developing uh, countries, it's a matter of really uh, finding uh, ways to um, allocating you know, funds properly, making sure that the uh, people who really need it the most will be able to uh, will be able reached by uh, this social protection assistance. So thank you, Mr. Jelani. And then for Dr. King, so another, this is a, a kind of a general question. And uh, we recognize that you have worked in uh, several uh, countries. You have an expansive an experience on that. And given that uh, experience, what do you think are the best practices of other countries that the Philippines can pick up on now, in terms of uh, narrowing the disparities in human capital? You know, the answer to that question, I think the speakers have answered. Many of the ideas, I think, have already been discussed. But I'm going to play a trick on you and turn and, and raise instead another point, if I might do that to you, which is, you know, the, the pandemic is not a one-off catastrophe or disaster, right? In the Philippines, we know we super typhoon, Earthquakes, you know, uh, are they come once a year at least? So the pandemic, we tend to think about it almost as a, a a one one event that we then have to recover from and so forth. I mean, Mike earlier mentioned the point about uh, making sure our education system, for example, but I would say also social protection system, as Mr. Jelani said, and the health system, to make them resilient. That means to say it's we're always prepared for these kinds of catastrophes or disasters, especially keeping in mind how the poorest, the most vulnerable will be affected. Because that's really what we're very interested in is to, to raise, to lift the, all boats. When we have a good social agenda, we have to think about the special vulnerability of the, 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 the groups that are at most risk. And so I would say that, for example, in education, we need something like an, 
learning continuity plan, for example, so that in areas that are affected by a super typhoon, I think about Leyte and the devastation in Leyte of the you know typhoon and tsunami and, and all that. And, and, and schools stop in the Barm region when there's armed conflict and kids and their families are transported to uh, an area for safety, they leave their schools behind and their teachers behind. And so what do we do about continu continuing their schooling? We, we can't, we, we, if we really are thinking about the poorest and the most vulnerable, we need to think about these situations. And that means to say our health system health system delivery, edu education delivery, and the cash pro program delivery. Should be thinking about how best to deliver those services when things are not normal. And again, let's not think about the COVID as the one, you know, one big disaster. It's, we have a series of them in the Philippines and not just in the Philippines, in all of Southeast Asia, actually. So I think in a way, that's what I hope we can think about when we think about a, 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 a social agenda, a human capital agenda that really thinks about the poor. We need to think about those situations and how we can adopt, we can adapt, I guess, how we can adapt our various systems, social systems to help the poorest. I'm sorry for Dr. Petya for, for not answering your question, but I thought that the, that the discussions of the speakers have all kind of pointed to many of the things that are the, the good things that we can do the, for the human capital, for human capital. But the one thing that I really wanted to hear was about how we can tackle the risks, address the risks that come many times a year to, to the country and to the region. That is a really good point. So it's not just, it's not as if it's the COVID-19 pandemic, it's the first disruption. So it's massive, but the disruptions are there every year. With the, uh, with the, with the uh, just as example would be the strong typhoons, with the school stopping, uh, children that are being able to go to school. So not just because of the lowest of income, but the public schools there, um, the infrastructure uh, are used as the, um, uh, as I use as um, where pe uh, families go, no, when uh, there are uh, yes, yeah, so, so school closures are not uh, just uh, happening, no, during the COVID nineteen, even before that. So thank you for pointing thing out that uh, Dr. King. So, yes, Mr. Luz. Yeah. This is uh, you know uh, building on what Dr. King was saying. Um, this is where uh, you know decisions have to be more local and um, uh, or even regional uh, our, our problem with our system is uh, we we tend to to look at solutions from a national level and then bring it down and i think one of the things that uh, we're finding out i mean if you take a look at this whole pandemic situation um you know we had a uh, we we basically locked down the country. Um, it was a national decision, uh, but really it was based on a, a few metropolitan areas that really had large problems. Um, you know, we could have opened the schools much earlier to face-to-face to -face and we didn't have to lock down communities quite as much as we did. Uh, for areas where the COVID was not as uh, as uh, as severe as uh, some of the metropolitan areas, but because we look at the metropolitan areas as the places where we make decisions, uh, you know, we we roll it out for the rest of the country. So I I think what we need to do, what we what we have to learn to do, is to to make decisions. Uh, more locally and more regionally. Let the local uh, government officials uh, and the local superintendents and the local health officers, etc., um, 
begin to start to give them, empower them to make more decisions about what they can do or what they can't do in the, in the, in the local areas. And I think that's the way we should be, be moving. Um, Thank you. That's a government's issue. Yes, thank you, Mr. Lucius. It's a matter of all strengthening and empowering the local government. So I think in other countries, uh, what they did was to uh, not to really close, what that's what I mentioned, not really close the whole education system to in-person le learning, but uh, a matter of geographical targeting. No, um, opening up some low-risk areas to in-person learning and mm -hmm. also prioritizing the younger children who needed uh, more of that um, professional uh, teacher, uh, teaching training uh, support. So I think Ms. Besiliote raised her hand earlier. Yeah, be, um, just kind of like a, an addition to, to what um, Dr. King and Mr. Luz mentioned about, you know, like um, just the governance structure right um of our education here i for example like i don't understand why we always take pride about you know the philippines being seven thousand whatever number islands but then when you think about education policy it's one size fits all um and you know during the the covid um years and it's it's we just closed down all of the schools without any any indicate like what mr lu said you know any um um, any space for local leaders to actually determine what is best for their communities. Um, and so I think we need to kind of get out of this mentality that everything needs to be decided from Manila and everyone just needs to follow um, and really empower local leaders and especially school leaders, right, to, to, to determine what is the best um, learning delivery mode for their communities. So I think a major reform uh, initiative should be a rethinking of the governance structure of our education system which actually um i just want to use this opportunity to push for one policy that's already um, being evaluated or being implemented now in in congress which is the education commission the second congressional education commission that was um that lapsed into law back in june um, and it's now being constituted by both houses of Congress. And the idea of this education commission is to rethink um, the entire education system, hopefully not just education, but looking at other um, sectors as well of society, social protection sectors that contribute um, to education outcomes. Um, and here, I, I think we need to think about rethink um, governance in the Philippines and especially education governance this, because resilience cannot be built by just a one-size-fits-all policy, right? We need to have policies on how we can empower school leaders. How do we get local communities involved um, and making sure that they do have all of these supports um, that they need to really become resilient with, with all these changes that we're now experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Basiliote. So thank you for raising that point about EDCOM 2. Uh, just also to announce uh, that the IDS is a research arm for, for EDCOM 2. So thank you, Ms. Basiliote, for raising uh, that point. And as well as that's a really, so what we're getting here is uh, really involvement uh, of uh, every sector of the society, not just coming from uh, a single, you know, like the national government, it's really making sure that uh, everyone the local uh, government, the civil society, uh, international organizations to be on board or having a common uh, objective on making sure that the disadvantaged uh, really segments of the society are being taken care of, which is the core of uh, social justice. So thank you uh, very much for our panelists. It's a really in insightful and engaging discussion. So I like that uh, uh, our panelists were... Um, um, jumping in also into their um, perspectives on the uh, uh, on the responses of other co uh, panelists. So that's a, a very um, I, I really like you know, discussion. Putting it those to the view, what are the really issues? What are the challenges? And how can we move forward? That given that this is Dr. King said that this is not just the COVID nineteen pandemic. It's not the first disruption. So there will, uh, it's not the first disruption. The Philippines has experienced several um, of them and we should uh, learn uh, from each of uh, these um, experiences. So 
given this that ends now our uh, moderated discussion so we're going now take uh, questions now from uh, our uh, audience so let me just uh, read out um, some of the questions so we have uh, mr feingold uh, with us here so uh, for this question is mr uh, feingold there is a really low literacy rate especially among the students in uh, public schools in the country how can we address it since we have issues in lack of resources such as teachers classrooms which results in shortened class periods and increase in number of students per classroom um dr petya i think is he um on the chat box that he cannot reconnect via video so i'm not sure if he can answer the question live but okay. he did say that he can answer via um he can writing email. on the q a okay. yeah okay thank you miss Maselote. so i think that question is in the uh, q a uh, box so um mr uh, feingold can answer that uh, question but if there's any of uh, the panelists uh, has uh, a, a take on that uh, question what was the question again? So uh, uh, there is a really low uh, liter literacy, uh, literacy. Uh, rate, yes, especially among the students in public schools in the country. So how can we address it since we have issues in lack of resources such as teachers, classrooms, which results in shortened class periods and increase in number of students per classroom? I can take a stab at it. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank that, you. Yes, the other, yes. yes. Um, yeah, so actually, um, there was a news article um, yesterday um, where, where that, that basically said that, you know, VP Sara, um, also Education Secretary, was saying that um, we need to think about innovative things, um, solutions to address the, the, in, the input gap. So with classrooms, teachers, etc. Um, and and um, while I think that, you know, it's not just about classrooms um, because learning can really happen um, anywhere, right, with the, with the right support, um, I do think that one, one um, easy available resource that we're not maximizing um, is actually the access um, so resources or access um, space in, in um, private schools. So you have private schools that have access classrooms. Um, it already happens in other countries where, you know, like the government pays for the, the, the use of the space um, in, in private schools to augment um, classroom shortages. So it's not just, you know, it, our usual thinking is, oh, we need to build classrooms, but, you know, it, we can't catch up. So why, why, why aren't we looking at, why aren't we looking um, at existing resources and then maybe utilizing or doing some complementary work? Um, but now specific to to literacy i think there is um it's already a big step that we are reopening our classrooms i think we have to continue on this path but because we are building resilience and making sure and and yeah the, the covid isn't the last thing we will the last crisis that we will encounter so really also investing in flexible um delivery modes like um you know, we are, we're already in the 21st century. Um, we need to invest in greater access to technology, addressing the digital gap um, that we have in this country. So getting, um, you know, kids, all our kids have access to to, to computers, to the internet. Um, there's so much content out there, really good content for math, um, science, um, online and they can really access that, but they need, they need the infrastructure to do that. And so, yeah. Um, guess to, 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 to answers to the question, um, you know, complementing resources from, from that already exist um, to, to augment the, the lack of resources in the public school system, and also really investing in all these technologies that could um, potentially um, reach many, many kids uh, at scale. Thank you, Ms. Basilote. That's a really interesting point. You know, making, um, having to use the, the private uh, resources from the private schools, especially I think um, many students, if I'm not mistaken, many students uh, have shifted uh, to public schools you know, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, actually leading to closures of um, some private schools. Uh, Dr. King, you unmuted yourself. Thank you. 
I think that that point about the the role of the private school is a very important one uh, because I think we need to think about the school system as a whole, not just sort of the public school system and then there's a private school system, but rather rather especially as we rethink about the the governance of the pub, of the school system. I think we need to think about the, the, the roles that <clears throat> the two sets of providers can play. Um, you know, public, public economics people would say, okay, government can finance, government can regulate, government can deliver. And we somehow think that the third one, which is the delivery, is, is what governments should be, definitely should be doing and nobody else. I think I don't think that was always the thinking in the Philippines. I seem to remember that not you know twenty years ago, let's say the the role of the private sector was a little bit closer to the in terms of the proportion, a little bit more even to to the presence of the private of the public schools. And I think it's not so so you can still have, so we shouldn't be equating private schools with elite private schools like private schools that are high cost and private schools that are only that 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 only will enroll you know higher income students the private schools are really the non government schools and they could be community schools they can be sectarian schools but they have a role to play and the the sooner that we accept the fact that the population of the philippines which is very young is very difficult to really completely serve in some of these social services, including schooling, and that it is very important for the government to realize actually that the private sector or the non-government sector can complement the role of the poorest, the most remote, the rural poor communities. And that's by the way, one thing that Indonesia did when it was expanding mass education was really funding the schools that are non-government, but were in remote islands, in re remote rural areas. And so if you looked at the, the spending, who, who was providing the resources to those schools that were non-government, the main, the main uh, source of the funding was really the government. Okay, and, and in the, metropolitan areas where communities were richer and they could supplement the government funding the government public fu funding of the of the public schools in the more in the bigger metropolitan areas was actually more even so that they were they were allowing the communities to top up government funding in the in the in the, in the communities they could afford to do so. but for the remote areas the gov which the government couldn't serve adequately and where, where there were specific needs of the communities, especially in indigenous groups, then the local community, the, the uh, religious organizations, not civic organizations, were all allowed to deliver with subsidies from gov government. So I think, so, so Ms. Bissellot's point about that is actually needs to be thought of in a more, as a way of of organizing the whole school system and not thinking about it as public, but ra rather that the public goals for education can be achieved by relying not just on the government uh, fund, uh, delivering services, but also what communi the community and the civic civil society can do. Thank you very much, no, Dr. King, for furthering the point of um, uh, Ms. Basiliote on the private uh, public sector complementarity you know, in the education system, which is apparently being done. Mr. Uh, Feingold has an answer on the chat box, which I would read for the sake of our uh, Facebook uh, viewers. Uh, provision of temporary learning spaces is a useful strategy for the short term. UNICEF has been supporting students with this type of solutions in Odette-affected areas. 
also strengthening distance learning modalities as complementary to in-person classes could also help. So thank you, uh, Mr. Feingold, for your uh, response to the question. So this is another question um, related to social protection uh, program. So I would like to direct this question to Mr. Jelani. So uh, from Ms. Graciela Moises, I would appreciate hearing present or proposed strategies on mainstreaming gender considerations in human development and social protection programs, both in targeting and delivery in the Philippines. Uh, can you share your experiences or insights about this? Yeah, sure, thank you. So in general, the evidence seems to suggest that when transfers are targeted towards women, um, these go a long way in uh, improving utilization of the grants towards um, children's health and education as well as maternal health. And so there's a strong um, case that's built on evidence uh, to target uh, transfers to women. Um, in the Philippines, there's been a declining share of female uh, grantees. Um, and part of the reason is because of mobility. Um, as uh, the primary recipient moves out um, uh, from uh, their original um, uh, residence in, in pursuit of economic opportunities, then, then the program, the Four Ps program has a provision um, to assign a new household member, which is often the husband, uh, to become the primary recipient. Um, or if, a, if the husband is not available, then a grandparent. Uh, as well, um, uh, but but I think beyond just the the targeting um, piece, there's also importance of integrating gender uh, sensitivity and considerations in um, the design and uh, delivery of the family development sessions, which is one of the conditionalities of the uh, the, the CCT program in the Philippines. Uh, and so understanding and raising awareness on the unique challenges that are faced uh, by women, improving um, um, uh, male and female understanding of, of these issues is important, something that we've been supporting uh, through enhancements to the uh, family development session modules, as well as the youth development session modules. Um, so, so those are two things that I, 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 I would um, probably um, want to highlight at this stage. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Jelani. Uh, so I, I think digital um, digitalization was mentioned earlier when it comes to uh, learning. So there's just that, I think this question is just uh, for uh, expounding uh, on that. So for from Ms. Jana Vismanos, so clearly learners are not learning even how to read. And there is evidence uh, that mass promotion continues. I think uh, this mass promotion is um, uh, in, um, mentioned by Mr. Luz earlier. So aside from focusing on basics, which are the reading, writing, and arithmetics, and on soft, quote unquote, uh, soft skills, now, what digital skills should kids be developing uh, to be able to have the future skills needed for employment? Any from our panelists who want to um, answer that uh, question? Perhaps uh, Mr. Luz? Well, uh, sorry. You, uh, you, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of different, what, what's called the, uh, what's broadly called the 21st century skills. Um, so these are, uh, you know, the critical thinking, problem solving, um, uh, innovation, etc. But uh, one of the, the skills that's mentioned is, um, uh, is uh, uh, the ability to, to work online and uh, to work with technology. And, um, you know, this is something that, um, uh, you know, frankly, um, if we could build the platform and, and make the platform available, um, you know, uh, children pick up these tools very quickly. Um, so while we might think that we have to, to teach them a lot of uh, 
of the software and the, and the tools. In fact, um, they are learning it. They're picking it up very, very quickly. You know, um, uh, when we were running, um, when my company was running schools in uh, Cavite, um, and uh, uh, we had uh, opened up the, uh, uh, this was before the pandemic, and uh, we had online teaching of students. Um, you know, uh, except for our very, very young teachers, you know, the, the fresh college graduates who were quite tech savvy themselves, the older teachers were actually behind even the students. The students were very, very quick at, uh, at picking up, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these tools. I think what teachers have to do is learn how to curate it rather than to try to, to uh, actually teach it. Um, help students um, evaluate what works for them, uh, what is useful, what is applicable, um, rather than, than to try to teach them, uh, you know, any kinds of uh, specific softwares. Um, because kids are very quick at picking these things up. Thank you, Mr. Luz. Uh, Ms. Basiliote, I think, raised her hand earlier. Yeah, no, just to add um, to what uh, Mr. Luce mentioned that 21st century skills actually yeah, is very important when it comes to employability. So um, PBED, right, we, we are the voice of the private sector when it comes to education reform. And whenever we talk to employers, they actually don't look for the technical skills. So they always say train for technical skills, but hire for attitude. And attitude is what they call, you know, 21st century skills are actually that, right? Like, um, uh, and and very important there is you know curiosity for example creativity um, um, and then I think it was Issy who mentioned it in his presentation when he cited PISA data on growth mindset um, that is very very important like when Philippi and I think um, you know we have in Filipinos unfortunately many of our many of our children and also us actually just as a people we think that you know hanggang dito na lang tayo which is we're just here until here where it's fixed right it's we're born with this that's it um but no right uh, if you invest in yourself and you and and also society um invests in you then you can really grow your potential and you can um really you know like aspire for more so um, I think, yeah, the teaching of 21st century skills, um, growing um, growth mindset in, in our school system and making sure that, you know, um, kids aren't uh, afraid to make mistakes, but, you know, learning from their mistakes and becoming better and better. Those are the, the critical skills, really, that we, that we need to teach because once you have that, then it'll be easy to, easier to teach them all these technical uh, skills that they will also need for, you know, profession-specific um, uh, jobs. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Basiliote. So, okay. Um, may I uh, direct this uh, question both to Dr. King and Mr. Jelani? Uh, so there is a group of workers who prefers uh, freelance work. And we know that uh, in the current system, freelance work is not covered by uh, the social protection uh, system. So how do you see uh, freelance economy becoming a sustainable, productive, and stable sector in the Philippine labor industry. Dr. King? I take it that freelance economy, you mean the gig economy? Sort of. yes. yes. Well, that's one of the, at least parts of that. Now, that means, that means unmonitored, generally low income, generally uh, no contract, all of those, all those things. In other words, also informal. So I'm just trying to see how you're how you're differentiating between what we used to call informal uh, uh, employment and this freelancer gig employment. 
are you are you are you are you saying that the gig is 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 more connected to new technologies, whereas the informal economy classification was not? I think it's a, the gig economy is also connected to informal employment, given that there are no formal uh, work arrangements in this type yes. of yeah. yes, mm -hmm. right. So so we can call it informal economy in general. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and 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 the difference between I think a lot of the the more industrial countries and the lower income countries is really that the informal economy is so much larger in size, and one of the things that I thought one of the new uh, policy that I think is quite modern thinking in the Philippines is a health insurance system that is not only for those who are employed in the formal sector. I, that is one one way to 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 for 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 the country actually to support to make sure that those who are I wouldn't say stuck because there is growth potential in the even in the informal economy. So if in the informal economy, what we want to do in terms of policy is to provide them also with the kinds of things that we're providing other people with more formal jobs. So access to, to uh, family leave, health insurance. So we've got to take care of those social safety nets and health safety nets. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, information, for example, the, the, one of the biggest problems I think in, uh, in labor markets is that the flow of information to help with um, employment, uh, to help identify job opportunities is usually not there. So with, you would think that with technology that will become easier. So that's a problem that I think we think more seriously about uh, to help people who are not going to be in the formal economy find uh, jobs in the informal sector that are uh, better paid, uh, more rewarding as well. So I think both one on, 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 on information, helping them get uh, better information and that's more possible these days um, to, ena to enable the, the uh, connection between opportunities and the workers and the potential workers and, and then the safety nets for them so that they, are, they also have access that are not connected to formal employment. Again, the informal sector is such a big part of the Philippine economy. So we cannot think about a successful social agenda without thinking about the issues that face informal workers. Thank you I very will... much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Jelani? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think uh, Dr. Kim uh, covered all the important points. Um, uh, from a social protection standpoint, I think um, you know, we, we know that uh, a large share of the informal sector uh, it, it comprises uh, the workforce uh, in, in, in developing economies and that majority of these workers are not covered by adequate social protection. Um, and so, uh, you know, from the three instruments of social protection, whether it's social assistance or social insurance or labor market programs, um, uh, there's a need to just sort of explore how um, how support can be extended across all three. Um, you know, the, the, the truth is that uh, the, the informal sector often faces very volatile incomes. And so while they may not be eligible for uh, constant uh, means tested programs that perhaps target the elder poor, uh, there's a strong argument that uh, these workers um, experience um, significant impacts in the face of shocks and a loss of income. Uh, and so uh, the, and certainly they should be part of um, socioeconomic registries and, and identification databases that allow governments to provide them support in anticipation of a shock uh, or immediately after a shock. Um, and they also should not be pushed into poverty following an illness or injury. Uh, and so extending social insurance and health insurance uh, is very important. 
And, and then from a, a labor market standpoint, um, you know, uh, providing temporary social assistance that is linked to skills development, as is the case in Indonesia with the Kartu Prakarja program that provides uh, temporary social assistance to informal sector workers or workers who've just been laid off and, um, and in incentivizes completion of a learning program so that these, these workers can acquire 21st century skills to, to succeed in the labor market. Um, and the last point that I think I would mention is that uh, women in the informal sector face particular risks. So, you know, a, a gender neutral shock like the COVID-19 pandemic should never have had disproportionate gender specific impacts. Uh, and we know uh, that women and girls were hit hardest. And so um, there's an important case to be made to extend uh, social services, um, care uh, services um, uh, to women and, and expand the range of social protection benefits uh, and support services that are available to women so that uh, they can continue to participate actively in the labor market um, uh, and, and be protected in the face of shocks. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Lan. Yes, Dr. King. Dr. Just to the point, uh, excellent point by, by uh, Dr. Jelani about um, je women uh, and the, the uh, higher vulnerability of women who are in the informal uh, sector. Is, is, is that also the improving their access to capital? Because if in the capital market, you know, they, if, if it's not gender blind, not gender neutral, if they face more constraints, and they do, we know that, right? Uh, then it's very, it's much harder for them when they face shocks to be able to recover, to be able to get out of it. So, so the, the solutions, true, are all are very much in the social protection, uh, in social insurance uh, areas. But let's also think about the business side of it, which is giving them more access, better access to, to capital so that they can recover. Thank you, Dr. King. So I just also would like to read out a comment from uh, Mr. Feingold. So he said, I mentioned that the girls are outperforming boys in the Philippines in almost all education indicators. However, the main issues for girls and women are in the transition to the labor market and accessing STEM uh, tech jobs, which is related to STEM education. Another important issue is to increase uh, early, childhood, uh, early childhood education, which would allow more women to access the labor market as well. So thank you to Mr. Feingold uh, to, for his comment. So I think we can just uh, take uh, one uh, last question, so very uh, short answer. So uh, I think uh, this can be answered by uh, Ms. Basiliote about uh, TESDA. I think this is also one of the uh, no, advocacies of, uh, of uh, PBED, if I'm not mistaken. So what are your suggestions in strengthening the linkage between TESDA training programs and industry needs and employment? Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. I'm typing an, <laughs> an answer to another question in the Q&A. Um, but yeah, uh, so in terms of linkages now with like private sector, um, I think we need to one, um, have better labor market information. So uh, making sure that, you know, we know what the jobs are, um, not just currently, but also in the future so that, um, so that uh, schools can really, um, and PVET institutions can really design um, their programs um, in accordance to what industry needs. So there is a better uh, matching of what industry needs and what the schools provide. Um, so labor market information is, is, is very important. The other thing that we push for in PVED is what we call platforms for collaboration. Um, TESDA has um, this this um, system called uh, the industry boards. I think they are a bit underutilized. They can really have a lot of, you know, it has a lot of potential in really getting, you know, private sector to 
to be in the same room with with Tesla folks and DVET folks so that they have these conversations and then they come up with activities and 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 um, projects or initiatives that they can do together. Um, and then I think lastly, it's really just you know when it comes to the training itself. Um, Tesla in Tesla has many programs, but one of their programs is called enterprise-based training. And so what that means is, you know, not only do you train in the technical vocational institution, you also train in company. So you actually get, you know, like real world experience uh, in the company floor. But um, that's also, well, on one hand, it is one of the, um, it has one of the highest um, employment uh, rates after graduation, but it is also the smallest program of TESTA. And so if we can grow that so that, you know, there are more companies opening enterprise-based training, um, and then also, you know, making sure that we incentivize companies well, because there, there are costs associated to this, then um, I think, you know, we can, we can really um, you know, encourage more linkage between TESTA and the private sector. It's, it's really a matter of just thinking about it also really holistically and looking at possible incentives for companies um, and then making sure that the conversation happens. I think a lot of people um, underestimate just being in the same room and talking about, you know, um, the, these things. Um, we actually have more things that we share um, or similar experiences that rather than differences. And so, yeah, um, really not just pitting government and industry against each other, but yeah, encouraging them to work together. Oh, and then maybe just another point, although a bit um, minor, but tangential, I think uh, it's, in, it's important that we actually um, um, bring about or bring out all of these success stories. Um, there are so many success stories A lot of companies just don't know about them. So um, if we can encourage more of these stories to be actually shared so that, um, you know, um, other companies will, will see that they work and that they could, it, it makes business sense, uh, it makes business sense for, for them to invest in the youth. Um, I think that would also encourage more um, collaboration between our TESDA and, and the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pasiliote. So unfortunately, um, um, uh, we're at, the, at the, the critical time. We have to close the, the forum, uh, the open forum. There are many questions that I think we can address in the, another uh, session. Having a really an excellent set of uh, speakers and panelists have opened up uh, discussions and ways to move forward uh, given the concerns that we have uh, in our country. So um, may I ask, no, uh, our just to as a closing uh, session for our um, as, uh, webinar, may I ask our uh, speaker and panelists to have just a closing remark, a, a sentence or two now for our audience. So just let me first uh, read out uh, Mr. Feingold's, uh, Feingold's uh, final remarks. I would like to have expressed my gratitude with PEDS, the panelists, and the public. It was an excellent session and would like to continue these discussions in the following weeks and months. We all have to play a role in improving Philippine discussion. Have a good uh, afternoon. So thank you, Mr. Feingold, for uh, joining us. And Dr. King, any uh, final remarks? Not much, not much more than just to thank everyone. And I, I, I love the discussion and I do hope that we can continue the discussion and that PIDS will. I think uh, we lost uh, Dr. Uh, King, but th thank you very much, uh, Dr. King. Uh, Mr. Luz, any final remarks? Uh, uh, yes, just to thank uh, PIDS and, and all the panelists um, for for being uh, with us this morning. Uh, a very rich uh, seminar. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luz. Ms. Basiliote? Um, a lot of gratitude to everyone here. Thank you. Um, thanks for having us. I really enjoy our partnership um, between Philippine Business for Education and Philippine Institute for Development Studies. I really like your event. This this one was very, very uh, enriching and I learned a lot. And thank you, Dr. Epetia, for 
a brilliant you know facilitation um i think it encouraged people to just jump in and it was a really rich discussion and i enjoyed it a lot thank you thank you very much Ms. Pesiliote. um mr jelani yeah thank you uh, uh you know first let me thank you for for moderating this very uh, engaging discussion uh, i think you did an, a fabulous job uh, let me also thank PIDS for inviting me to this very important policy conference and conversation and and frankly to all the panelists and speakers for their uh, extremely uh, valuable and insightful um, remarks and comments. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jelani. I just can't express no, my gratitude enough for your participation and your engagement in this uh, very um, a very important uh, topic of uh, for the Philippines when it comes to a systematic area uh, for social justice. So once again, I want to thank our uh, speakers, panelists, and uh, the audience for your very uh, active uh, participation. Uh, before we end today's uh, webinar, we want to want inform, inform you that you may get copies of the presentation from the PIDS and DPRM uh, websites. Uh, for those who join us online, help us make our future events uh, better by giving us your feedback. Please uh, follow uh, the link, which is now uh, flashed uh, on the screen. And this is just the second uh, webinar. We have two more. So we want you to invite in the succeeding webinars of uh, the 8th Annual Public Policy Conference. The third webinar, which tackles on uh, public health services and infrastructure, will be on September 20, Tuesday at 9 a.m. The fourth webinar is about environmental resilience and climate uh, change, together with the closing program of the annual public policy conference, which will be on September 22, uh, Thursday at 9 a.m. We hope uh, to see all of you uh, there in the next week for the additional uh, for the next uh, two webinars of uh, the APPC. Finally, we would like to thank uh, all the offices uh, from the government, the academe, the private sector, a civil society, international development community community and the media that joined us today. The names of these offices are flashed on the screen. Muli, maraming salamat at isang magandang araw sa ating lahat.